Welcome back, everyone. If you're just uh, uh, joining us, welcome as well. Thank you for joining us again for a virtual meeting on the extremely low probability of rupture, probabilistic fracture mechanics code, or XLPR. This is on running the simulation and retrieving results. My name is Matthew Homiak, and I'm NRC's lead in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research for the XLPR program. My counterpart from the Electric Power Research Institute, Craig Harrington, is with us as well. The purpose of today's meeting is to help new XLPR users get started using the code by showing how to run a simulation and retrieve results. The meeting today is a continuation of our XLPR technical seminar, seminar series. If you've attended all our meetings so far, do you go ahead and just let us know by sending us a message in the chat here? In the first seminar, we reviewed the models in XLPR. In the second seminar, we showed how to set up the inputs directly using the input set file and the sim editor. As part of that seminar, we included a demonstration on how to set up inputs for challenge problem one in your training manual. In today's seminar, we will show you how to run an XLPR simulation and look at the results. And the demonstrations today will show you how to complete challenge problem one by writing the input set we prepared in the last seminar. We invite you to follow along with us today, ideally using an input set you prepared for challenge problem one, or you could use the default input set in your XLPR main folder. In our final seminar next week, we'll cover a range of advanced methods, and this will extend, essentially be an extension of the prior seminars on the inputs and today is on running the simulation. We are recording all these seminars for later viewing, so don't worry if you missed any details. You can view those by going to youtube.com and searching for XLPR and looking for our logo. The video for the first seminar is posted, and I think we have the video for the second seminar posted by the end of this week. Here's our agenda for today. We're currently in the introduction and opening remarks portion. Then we'll review the file structure again briefly, uh, show you how to run the preprocessors. We'll show you how to set up the sampling options and how to control run using GoldSim. Then we'll show you how to look at the results and interrogate any errors that you may have in the simulation. After that, we'll show you quickly how to uh, use GoldSim to navigate through the XLPR computational framework. Uh, we'll have a break. And then we'll open up the floor for a good portion of the uh, latter part of the meeting for any questions that you may have. This is an NRC Category 3 public meeting, and that means the public is invited to participate provide, by providing comments and asking questions throughout. We're using the WebEx platform to deliver the meeting, and this is how we plan to take your questions. You can submit them at any time using the Q&A feature, and shown on the slide here is a short review on how you can display the Q&A feature, depending on whether you're using WebEx in your internet browser or through the desktop client. At designated points, we may also invite you to ask questions verbally. If you'd like to ask questions then, please use the raise hand feature. We'll call on you and unmute your line. Today, our main presenter is Dr. Cedric Salaberry from the Engineering Mechanics Corporation of Columbus, under contract to the NRC and I would probably consider him to be our chief expert on XLPR, so we're all in capable hands today. And backing him up is our usual team of experts. That includes Craig and myself, Marcus Burkhart from Dominion Engineering, Nathan Glunt from the Upper Staff, and Marge Erickson from Phoenix Engineering Associates. Giovanni Facco from the NRC staff is helping out again as our WebEx host. If you're having any difficulties with WebEx setup, you can just reach out to him uh, as the host directly in the chat feature. Uh, right now, Giovanni should be sharing a short poll with you all. And this is just to help us get a, a, a better feel on uh, your experience with XLPR and to help the presentation team here um, for the content. Uh, we'll leave this open for a little while. If you wouldn't mind filling it out, we appreciate it. And we'll take a look at the results together a little bit later. Craig, would you like to add anything? And uh, get unmuted. Uh, I appreciate everyone joining today uh, in the NRC hosting these meetings. I know there are some people still working through challenges 
uh, I think maybe with the the end user license agreement to access XLPR and certainly if there are issues that I can help with in that regard, please contact me. Otherwise, uh, thanks for joining and I'll turn it back to, to you, Matt. Okay. Thanks, Craig, and thanks again, everyone, for being here today. Okay. Um, with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Cedric to start our presentation. Thank you, Matt. So as Matt says this time, what we'll try to do is give you an overview of how to run the code. And doing this, we have prepared a set of slides, but what we plan to do is also uh, make a demonstration when we uh, do the uh, do the running, and as you can see now, I'm sharing my screen. So what I will do is taking some pause from the presentation and implement everything was said. And we invite you, for all of you who have the code, to try on your side to do it. We will do it for challenge problem one, but if you have any uh, input, Excel input file, it will work the same way, the result will be different, but all the rest will be exactly the same. So let's go back to the presentation. And uh, for this presentation, as a resource, we recommend the user manual and mostly chapter three. In chapter three, you will find section 332, which talks about the sample size and how to set up the random seed, section 3.4, which focuses on running the code. Then section 3.5.2 deals with error inspection, and you will find in chapter 5 all the list of potential error codes. And finally, section 3.5.3 deals with the results. Another source that's not available yet that will be available in the future is XLPRGR FW. This is a computational framework, framework development testing and analysis document. Okay, so we will start with the file structure and how to navigate through XLPR. So we discussed about this last time. Once you receive the zip file, you unzip, and you will have several folders. Some of these folders are for information or database. Here we are interested with two folders. The first one is a DL folder that contains all the dynamic links library, uh, which are the module for XLPR. And then the folder called XLPR main, which contain the framework, so the goal theme, player file, which is a .gsp or the full version, the pro version, .gsm, as well as the input Excel file, which we mentioned and discussed during the previous seminar, and an Excel add-in. So this file is really the one you will work with, and you can create copies of this folder for your different case, as long as the copies are in the same level as the DLL folder, the golfing pipe can be run and you can generate results. Once XLPR has been run, the golfing pipe will have all the results in it, so you can copy anywhere and you can access from any location to see the result. As long as you don't run it, you can copy anywhere. One thing about the file name, the Excel input file name is called XLPR-2.1 input set of XLSX. It, this name cannot be changed. GoalSim requires this name to read the input. However, the GoalSim name itself can be changed. Whether it's a pro version or the player version, you can change it. So in theory, you can also have multiple GoalSim files in the same folder. They will read the same Excel file, but you can have multiple files. And this can be useful if you want to make replicate runs. By replicate runs, we say, we mean, well, you could run 
the same simulation with different random seed. And then if you have a simulation of 10,000 realization, you can do it five times and then you have 50,000 realization. Of course, the DL folder name and the DLL name cannot be changed for the same reason that for the XL5, you, you need the correct name to be called, so that's a mistake. Now, if you want to run Excel PR, you have about six steps. The first one is to set up your program. This was the purpose of the previous seminar. So it's all the option you can set in the input set file directly or using the um, GUI that will write into Excel. The second step, and I will go through it just after this, is to run the preprocessor. We have two preprocessors you can run in uh, Excel PR. Once you have done this, you can set up the calling parameter, which are mostly the sampling option and some output settings. And then you can run calling as a fourth step. Once you run calling, you save. It's really important to save, and I will mention this a little later. And finally, once you have your calling run done and saved, you can save and extract the results. So we'll go, we'll go through. Uh, all step, but the first one that was covered with, uh, during the previous seminar. So let's start with step number two, which is running the preprocessor. So one question is, why do we want, why do we have preprocessor in XRPR? The reason is to improve run types. Uh, there are calculations such as leak rate and stress intensity factor for transients that takes time. So we have one preprocessor for each. So to calculate leak rate as a function of crack opening displacement and crack lengths, we have LIPO, which was developed by Oak Ridge, which stands for leak analysis of piping Oak Ridge. And for the stress intensity factor and other information for transients, so if you consider fatigue, we have Tiffany, which stands for thermal stress intensity factor for any current story, which was developed by SIA. What these preprocessors do is they create lookup table as a function of the input we mentioned, and GoldSim will just linearly interpolate uh, in the, from this table during simulation, which is a lot faster than calling the code, having the calculation at every time step or main calculation at every time step. And the purpose of the preprocessor is just speed up XLPR. The preprocessor are accessible via the Excel adding. And so this is the second file, uh, Excel file you have in the XLPR main, which is called XLPR-2.1 preprocessor.xll. This add-in works only with a 32-bit version of Excel. If you try to use it with a 64-bit version of Excel, you will have an error right now. So this Excel add-in has been developed without a digital signature. So when you start it, by double clicking on this element, you will first have a Microsoft security notice saying that there's no digital signature, so it can be a half poor uh, DLL. Uh, so what you have to do is to enable it, and you will have to enable every time you use it. So you have two buttons, and you can click on the lower left button, which say enable this add-in for this session only. Once you click this, you will have access to the ID. Now, what's possible is some company's security protocol block any macro coming, so they will be disabled. In this case, you will have to check with your IT department uh, to enable this ID. The second thing is if you have the 64-bit version of Excel, or if you don't know, you may end up to have this message that you see on the bottom left. Here. It will say that the file format is not recognized and may be corrupted. And if you press yes or no, it will just not run the ID. Now let's suppose that you have the correct version of Excel and you can run the ID. Once you activate it, you will have an information message on the file location. So this preprocessor must be run where the Excel inputs and the Golson file are located because it will open the Excel file and check that everything is here and it also needs to have access to the DLL. 
So once you press OK over this option, you will have a ribbon, and then you will be able to run the preprocessor. So here I will make my first stop from the presentation and show you how to set up everything we have talked up to now. So let's go back to the screen sharing. So here is a, a window containing all the uh, data from uh, the zip file. So we're on the XLPR 2.1. I have XLPR main, I have the DLL. The first thing I will do in this example is make a copy of the XLPR main and I will rename it challenge problem one. Because that's the challenge program we can run. The second thing I will do is copy what we have presented two weeks ago, which is the new input set with the changes and paste it in challenge problem one. And while you don't have to do it, I will delete this Slipo and Tiffany, which are the preprocessor folder, just to show you how they are created every time you call the preprocessor. So here it is. I have my two goals in file. I have the input file and I have the XLR. So the XLL is a file I want to run. So I will double click on it. It will load Excel, so it takes a few time, a few seconds to load everything from Excel. And then you have the message from the uh, Microsoft Excel security where you want to enable this adding. When you do this, you have a message, and then you will have on the top, a new menu in the main ribbon. So this is called XLPR preprocessing. If you click on this, you have this set, this four set of new buttons. So here, because the uh, preprocessor takes some time, I will go ahead from uh, the presentation and press on this. I want to run Tiffany to have the new uh, transient, even if our case does not include fatigue. And I will press the start button in the new window to start the execution of Tiffany. The preprocessor will read all the information from the Excel file and start to copy it here. And once it starts to run, you will have a bar here that increase and a percentage that will appear to tell you how far you are in finishing to run the preprocessor. So let's move back now. Let's move back to the presentation. So as we have said, we have activated the Excel add-in, and now we have access to a new menu. On this menu, you have four buttons. The first, the first button is to inspect the database. So it's look at the table you have created and compare them if needed. We won't cover this in this presentation. What we want to focus is on the three next button. So this button will run Tiffany and Lipo. We have two buttons for Tiffany, and the reason is Tiffany uh, depends on some of property for the pipe, so pipe geometry. And when you have mitigation, some of the mitigation, such as uh, it may overlay, may impact the pipe geometry. And so you may need to rerun uh, Tiffany to have the correct stress intensity factor when you have uh, a different geometry. The first button is for pre mitigation. The second button is for post mitigation. And finally, LIPO is the last button where you can calculate this um, leak rate lookup table. The next question you may have is when do you want to run this preprocessor? Oh, sorry. Uh, there's another slide before that which, uh, which describes what I have just done. Uh, once you click on the button, uh, you have a new window 
whether it's for Tiffany or Lipo, you press the start button, it will start to do the calculation. Uh, and once it's completed, you will have a message confirming that the calculation are complete. Uh, all the input used by Tiffany and all the output are also saved in the text file with the date and time appended, so it's a unique text file, so you can check which input were used and which output were used. Once you have this message, you can close the information box, you can close the Tiffany, and you have done the calculation. So, going back to what I was saying, when do you need to run this preprocessor? But the first question is, what happens if you don't run this preprocessor? Well, if you don't run, Gorsim will try to read the last text file generated. If you have this folder, Tiffany and Lipo, and already populated with text file, Gorsim will read this text file and just use this data. Gorsim does not care whether you have just run or if you have run them two weeks ago. If this file do not exist, Gorsim can still run and use what was initially in the lookup table created in the file. So whatever is safe in the lookup table and read for the last time will be used. However, Gorsim will warn you in a warning message just to let you know that this file didn't exist, so it uses the latest version he had for the data. Now, when do you want to rerun this? The first question is, do you model fatigue? If you don't model fatigue, you don't need to run Tiffany because these are the stress intensity factor for the transient. If you run, if you include fatigue, you need to run Tiffany at least a pre mitigation. If you have mitigation, then you will also need to run Tiffany post mitigation. If you don't have mitigation, you won't need to run it. For LiPo, it depends if you have a change in temperature range, pressure range, or pipe geometry. By default, LiPo is defined for a wide range of temperature, pressure, and pipe geometry to avoid having to rerun it. But if you change, you may have to rerun LiPo. In the Excel file, and it was mentioned during the last seminar, there is a color coding. The color coding that's reported here on the right part of this presentation is from the property tab. So if the properties that are in Excel are used by both Lipo and Tiffany, it's highlighted in yellow. If it's used by Tiffany only, it's highlighted in purple. And if it's used by Lipo, it's highlighted in green. This information helps you to know that if you change this value, you may have to rerun Tiffany or you may have to rerun Lipo. Now, in terms of tips, what we would recommend is if you are if you are unsure, it's safer to rerun the preprocessor because the date will coincide with the run date, and it avoids any confusion. The preprocessor takes some time to run, but usually they still run, you know, in uh, 15, 10 minutes, depending on the complexity. And if it's done, you don't have to rerun them. So it's done once, uh, you can use them. Uh, another point is the point Tiffany generates new folder with the name uh, Flippo and Tiffany to us the table. You can delete this folder, they will be recreated uh, if needed. What we recommend if you rerun is to delete this folder and rerun everything so you can confirm that the latest value are used. And once you have done this and your preprocessor are ready, you're ready to look at Golfing file and look at the Golfing settings dashboard. So this is when you can run the code. If you have the pro version of Golfing, you will open the .gsm file. If you have the player version of Golfing, you will open the .gsp file. Where whatever you can do with the player file, you will be able to do it with the pro version of Golfing, and you will have more uh, functionalities. So for this demonstration, I will use a player file to show you that everything we present can be done with a player file, but everything can be applied also to the pro version of Golfing. No matter what, 
when you open any of them, you will start with the global setting dashboard, which is displayed here uh, in the uh, presentation. I will focus on the first part, which is at the top here. The first one, which is highlighted with a green box, is a sampling approach. These are the sampling options that you cannot set up in Excel and you will have to set up in Dolphin. Some of these options are for the epistemic loop, that's the left button here. Some are for the aleatory loop, that's the right button here. Whatever you change in the sampling will be reflected in the display below for all the sampling options, for some of the sampling options, like the sample size, whether you use important sampling or not, whether you use adaptive sampling or not, the discretization if you use DPD and so on. This is just for information purposes to check that this is really the run you want to make. You're going to change this, it's just a display. And once you have done this, you have set up your sample the way you want, and you have confirmed with the display, you can run the code. You have two buttons that are highlighted with the blue box here. The first one is to refresh all inputs. So this is where once you have done all your changes, you want to be sure everything is okay, you can refresh the input. The second one is to run the model. Not that. If you run the model by default, XLPR will refresh all inputs. So whatever has been changed at last will be taken into account as soon as you press run the XLPR model. So now we will look in more detail what you can do for the sampling approach. So if you click on the first, the upper left button on the epistemic, which is also the outer loop, you will have the option uh, on the sample size. So you have three main options that you will use most of the time. This is the sample size, the use of LHS or not, and if you want to repeat the sampling sequence. So the sample size is pretty straightforward. It's you're doing a probabilistic analysis. How many samples do you want to do? Not that's the epistemic sample size. So if you have an epistemic, the outer loop sample size, and an aleatory sample size, the inner loop, the total number of samples is a multiplication of two. So for instance, you have five epistemic and 10 aleatory, the total number of samples will be 50. So here you set up only the epistemic sample size. The second main option is whether you want to use lighting hypercube sampling or not, LHS. If this box is checked, then you use LHS. If it's unchecked, then you don't use LHS. Not also that if you check the box, you will have another menu here where you can use a traditional LHS that sample randomly into each strata, or you have the midpoint LHS that use the median into each strata. The third main option is the one called repeat sampling sequence. So this is linked to the random number generator. If this box is checked, you control the random seed for the random number generator. And you can set it up on the right. That means that your results are reproducible as long as you use the same random seed. By default, it's always checked and you can change random seed. If you uncheck this box, then the random seed will be generated randomly based on the time or location and so on. So your result won't be reproducible. Now, as you can see in this window, there are other options. So we will cover them, even so they are not used as much or they are more advanced options. The first one, which is highlighted in green is here, is to run a specific realization. So if you're interested for, you know, you run Android epistemic realization, but you want to see what's going on for realization five out of 100, you can select this. Uh, this is what we recommend for this deterministic run, and this will be covered uh, in the next presentation, the advanced method. Another option you see here is the use of weight for the important sampling. So, 
here, this is a difference between golf sim, the uh, framework model we selected, and Excel PR. In Excel PR, we consider that you should always add this box check. This box is used when you use important sampling, because important sampling try to focus on one area of your sample space. And so because it's oversampling this area, you need to use a lower weight, and the undersampling area needs a higher weight. So if you don't check this box, important sampling will not work. If you use regular sampling, of course, you don't need a weight, but by default, uh, equal weight will be used so it will work. So here, what we recommend is even if you don't use important sampling, keep this box checked all the time. And for the same reason, go sim, the code include a deterministic simulation, which is slightly different from what we have. You could use this in theory, but what we recommend is to uncheck this box, uh, except you are included on deterministic approach that will be described in um, the next training. And it's, uh, it will be easier to use this approach than trying to use this one. So this box should be always unchecked and the uh, realization uh, weight should be always checked. On the bottom, you have an information of the file size, which we will talk about when we go to the memory uh, management of XLPR. Now, we have covered this upper left button, which is for epistemic uncertainty. Now we will cover the next button, which is for aleatory uncertainty. So because it's a submodel, it's slightly different when you press on it, you will be by default on the definition tab. So you will have to click on the Monte Carlo tab to have the same control on sample size. So highlighted in these two blue box, these are exactly the same option as the epistemic uh, loop. So I won't cover it again. There are a few differences for the aleatory. The first one is on the number of realization. You can see here, there is a lock. It means that this value has been locked. And instead of having a number, you have a reference, which is uh, C017, which refers to uh, variable 107 in the um, Excel input file. This means that the aleatory sample size is not controlled by Colsim, it's controlled in the Excel file. You have set it up in Excel, you don't need to set it up here. The second option that is not included in uh, the epistemic is this one. And to understand this option, uh, we have to point out that the epistemic loop in our model is the outer loop, and the aleatory loop is the inner loop, which means that when we run the code, we'll start with epistemic one, and then we will run all the aleatory. Let's say if your sample size is 20, you will do epistemic one and aleatory one to 20, then epistemic two and aleatory one to 20 and so on. Now, you have an option here which says use a different random seed for each realization of the parent model. The parent model being the epistemic loop. If this option is unchecked, it means that you will use the same value again and again for the aleatory each time you change for an epistemic. So let me explain this a little more uh, with an example. Let's suppose you have an, an epistemic sample size of five, and an aleatory sample size of 10. If this box is unchecked, it means that once you run epistemic one, you will sample 10 value for every aleatory variable. But when you move to epistemic two, the same 10 value will be used again. And when you move to epistemic three, this 10 10 value will be used again. So even if at the end you do 50 simulation, you only sample the aleatory value tens and you use each of them five times. If you check the box for the aleatory, 
different value will be sampled. So once you are on epistemic one, you will have 10 values. When you go to epistemic two, you will have 10 different values and so on. So at the end, you will sample the aleatory variable 50 times. You will have 50 different values. So here, it's really depending on how you want to do your analysis, whether you want to repeat or not. Our recommendation, however, is to keep this box checked because you have more variability in your aleatory uncertainty. So these cover the different options you have, uh, the sampling option you have in Dorsey. Now, we will summarize this with this slide to tell you what do you need to set up in Dolphin, what do you need to set up in Excel, and what is set up in both. So you have a variety of sampling strategy in Excel here. You can use one or two loop. And when you use one loop, you can use either the aleatory or the APC. This will be set up both in Excel and Dolphin. You can control, of course, the epistemic sample size and the random seed, and this is what we just seen is set up in Dolphin. You can do the same thing with the inner aleatory loop, except the sample size is set up in Excel, the random seed is set up in Dolphin. You can apply LHS by just checking the box, it's done in Dolphin. You can apply important sampling on selected value. It can be done on either or both loops. And you can use discrete probability distribution on either or both loops. All of this can be done um, together. So you can use you know, LHS with important sampling. You can use important sampling without LHS. You can use DPD with important sampling and so on. For the last two, they will be set up in Excel. They have been described quickly uh, in the previous presentation. And the next presentation, we will go in a little more detail on how you can run important sampling and how you can use DPD. And finally, there is the option we just mentioned about repeating the random data if you want more variability in your inner aleatory loop or if you want to repeat the same thing. And all of these are mixed together so you have a large variety, uh, variety of sampling strategy when you use Excel here. Once you select your strategy, it's time to run the code. You can refresh data to be sure that everything is okay but then you're ready to run the code. So we'll do an example with challenge problem one. In the player version of golf theme, you have three ways to start the run. You can press the button in the uh, dashboard, which say run Excel PR. You also have access to the run controller and you can press the play button. And finally, you have a shortcut with the key F5 on your keyboard. Any of the three will work. Okay, now what we'll do is we'll make a break. We'll go back here to the presentation and go a little more on the uh, run controller, but I will demonstrate how you can set up everything we have described and run the code. The code takes a little time to run. We are doing about 200 realization in this example, so it takes about seven minutes. So we'll set this up, and then we'll move back to the presentation to talk a little more about the controller. So we have left our example where we were running the preprocessor. And as you see, Tiffany has finished now, so I can close it and close this. So Tiffany has been run, and we have the calculation. If I go to my folder now, LiPo and Tiffany are created again. You can see LiPo is empty because I didn't run LiPo. If I move to Tiffany, now I have every of the table that are read by Goldstein. So it goes from table 51 down to table 84 have been created for the free mitigation and they're available which means that golf team will be able to read them. Now, as you see, when we open XLL, it also opens the input set. This is the challenge problem one. We have changed the period one to be 35 years, so it's 35 times 12 months. 
And if we go to the properties a little higher, we can see that for the second period, we kept the same pressure, but we changed the temperature to a distribution. So we had set up change problem one. If you don't have this file, but still want to test at the same time, it's fine. You can use the existing uh, input set to run this. So let me close it now. Well, nothing has been changed, so I can close it. And now we'll open the clear file. So for this, you can double click if you have Gold Team 11.1, or if you have a shortcut, you can go here and click on your shortcut for um, Gold Team. And here I am in the folder for challenge problem one. So since I'm already here, I don't have to navigate through the structure. So I select Excel PR 2.1. Golf team will load everything, and then we'll have access to the Excel PR model. And as I say, it will open to the dashboard. The top part is what we discussed about setting the sampling approach. If I put epistemic, so here you see everything is great. The reason is if you haven't rerun anything, we are in result mode. Uh, by default, Corsina has been run. So we need to go back to the edit mode. We'll cover this later. I click on this button to delete everything. Yes, I want to delete everything. And I'm going back to the edit mode. It will take a few minutes and we'll see that the message ready is appearing with the controller. So now I'm in edit mode and nothing is great, so I can work on this. I will change the sample size to 10. And I will say, yes, I want LHS for the epistemic loop. Now I close it. I click on the aleatory button. As we said, we start with the definition, so we have to move to the Monte Carlo tab. The number of realization is set in Excel, so I don't change it, but I can put, for instance, the use of LHS. And then I press. Now, this sample size has been updated directly. I could refresh the input and this will disappear to say that we don't consider important sampling. But since it will be refreshed anyway, I will just run the model. As we say, I can press here. I can press the play on the controller. Or I can press F5. In this case, I will just press this one. Now, the first thing you will see when you run the model is Colsim will have to download all or import all the, the external data. So it includes all the DLLs. Goldstein will import the DLL, put them in memory so it's ready to be used. It includes all the information you put in the Excel file. All the modifications and so on needs to be updated. So Goldstein will read this, update the correct element, and say, no, I have, now I have all this correct information. It also includes all the table we mentioned uh, the uh, pre-processing table from Lipo, from um, Tiffany. And so all of these will be uploaded. If they are not available, you will have a warning message at the end. We'll cover this a little later. And then go in. Once everything is downloaded, we'll start running. So the downloading of all this information takes between 20 and 50 seconds, depending on your computer. And then, once this is done, as I say, you go into run mode and the calculation will start. So running will take about seven minutes. So we will go back uh, to the presentation and discuss about the Golfing Run Controller and let the code finish the running. Um, for your information, uh, I'm running right now on a laptop. It's a um, five years old laptop. It, it's still a good laptop, but it's not top of the line. So. If you run it on a desktop computer or a newer laptop, it will be probably faster than on my computer. Okay, let's move back to the presentation. And as we said, we were into running Golsi. So we have set up everything and we run Golsi. Now we have this run controller that control everything it's on of running. So let's look at this a little in a little more details. You have three main modes in the run controller. 
The first one is the edit mod. This is where you can change the model, set it up everything to be ready to run. The second one is the running mod itself. This is the one we have just seen. And the third mod is the result mod. It's like once the run is done and the results are available. So you don't run, but you still have access to all the results that we have generated. We will focus on three icons on the bottom part of the controller. And these three icons have different meaning depending on which mod you are. The first one on the left is to be ready in edit mode. So it deletes all results if there is any result or it about the simulation and it's prepa goes in to be run. So of course, if you're in edit mode already, it will be grayed out. And this is what you see here in the left of the edit mode. If you're in run mode, it means that you want to be in edit mode, so it will abort the current simulation, and it will ask, do you want to delete the result or not? If you don't delete the result, you will go in result mode with whatever you have. If you delete the result, you move back to edit mode. And if you're in result mode, it will delete any result and go back to edit mode. The second button is the one where you want to run. So we have seen this already. It looks like the triangle at play button. If you're in edit mode, it just means, oh, I want to run the mod. If you're in result mode, it means that it will delete any information, well, output you have, and start to run again. And finally, if you're in run mode, you're already in run mode, this is replaced with a pause button. Right? You can pause and look at where you are in the simulation. Now, you have another button, which is on the right part of the set of icons here, which is called the menu button. The menu button will give you access to different menu. If you have the pro version of GoSim, it's already available on top of your window. If, if you have the player version, it's not available, so this button is really important. It gives you access to the file option, so you can load a new file and you can save or save as. It also gives you access to navigation if you want to see the uh, inner mechanism of the XLTR model. Of course, if you're in run mode, this button will be great because you don't want to save or you don't want to navigate and change something while you're running the code. So let's go into a little more detail of the edit mode and the running mode. So as we say, if you want to see edit mode, you will see it because it's written ready on the right part. It tells you how many realizations you plan to have. The elapsed time is set to zero because nothing has been run. You have option as a play. You can run the simulation. And you have the menu option that helps you to save. So if you click on the menu option, you will have a rolling menu here. And you can go to the file to open, save the file. This is pretty straightforward. Now, same thing for the running mods. Now, we don't have ready, we have running. As soon as you run the model, you will have the elapsed time increasing so you can see uh, how much time has spent since the beginning of the simulation. The realization number will indicate which realization is run out of how many. In this case, it was only one epistemic realization out of one, so it's not very informative. Now it's the epistemic realization, not the total realization. You can stop, you can pause as we discuss. Now, if you want to see the aleatory realization, you can do it by hover your mouse on the controller. If you hover your mouse on the controller, as you can see down here, you will have a information window popping up tells you which epistemic realization is run and which aleatory realization is run and which time step is run. In this example, it was aleatory realization seven. It was just at the beginning. So it can tell you where you are in your uh, simulation. Now, once the run is finished, an important step is saving the run. It's really important. Uh, we'll talk about this memory um, management. Gold seems save a lot of data. And if you try to display them, it will require more memory. 
and sometimes you may have the software crashing. If the file crashes because there is not enough memory, it will open again, but nothing will have been saved. So if you have run your case and you crash it, then you lose everything and you have to rerun again. So every time a run is performed and is finished, you save the run. So how do you do that? If you're in the player, this is where the menu button in the um, run controller plays a role. You click on it, you go to file, and you have an option for save or save out. Not that the shortcut like Control S and Alt plus FA also works. If you're in the full version, everything of this is also available. But you have another option, which is on the top here, you have the file menu. You can go and you will have save, save as, save the copy. And an additional option, which is not available in the player file, which is called save player file. When you have the pro version of Corsin, you can always save as a player file, whether you are in edit mode or result mode, which means you can create player file version with, as edit mode so people can run with a player and you can make some change. You can also create result version as player so people with a player can look at your result. So it's a really important feature because while the pro version of all things uh, is not free, the player is free, so it means that if you have a few pro license, then you can have people saving results that will be available for anybody who has a player version as long as you can save as player. Okay, and once the run is finished, generally you will have a run log generated. This run log gives you information if anything happened, you know, that's not expected during the run. It will also include some information of when the run was performed, when it was finished, how long it took, and so on. Uh, you will have a set of warning or potential errors. Usually, you will have only warnings. Uh, you may want to check this. After a while, if you know the warning, you may decide not to check. Uh, an example of warning is if you have once rerun the preprocessor and if you have deleted the uh, text file, then Dolphin will warn you, well, I use whatever is saved in GSM or GSP, but I was not able to find any text file. Once the run is done, you have access to this file, and if you press yes, you will see it. If you press no and want to look at it, this file will be saved in the folder, and it's called golfin runlog.txt. So now I will make another break uh, to show you how we can um, do this, and you will have the opportunity to follow on and try by yourself. So let's go back to sharing the screen. Okay, and now you see that I'm done with the run. We have the 10 out of 10 realization finished. I'm in result mode because it's finished. It took about nine minutes and 11 seconds to run. And Colson proposed me to look at the one. So I can press yes. And I open this file, the so text file I say, which is golfsim runlog.txt. Give me the name of the file run, the starting time, how long it takes, and then a set of warnings. As you recall, we haven't rerun Tiffany post mitigation and we deleted the results. So Golfsim informed us that the file was not found, so nothing was imported and the original value was used. As I say, an important step is to save before looking at any of the results. So I go to File, Save As, and we'll save with a different name here as underscore results. It takes generally about uh, you know, 10 to 20 seconds to save, depending on the size. Uh, if you have large size and uh, you need to save three gigabytes, of, obviously it takes a little more. 
Now, if I go here in my folder, you can see that now the file is saved and the size is about 143 megabytes. Uh, I have access to the Gold Sim RAM and uh, I have access also to an error log in case there was error. In this case, we don't have errors, so that's why it's only one table. Okay, so this concludes the first part of this presentation. We will take a break now, a five minute break. Uh, if you have any question, uh, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A uh, to, um, Don't hesitate to use the Q&A so we can ask uh, for your question. Uh, we can answer your question. And uh, as usual, uh, here are the email you can use uh, in the future. If you have any question with respect to Exopia, uh, please send this to both nrc.gov and epic.gov. And on yeah. that note, uh, Matt, that's it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Cedric. Uh, we wanted to go ahead and uh, put up the poll again, uh, just because we got uh, a little bit lower response rate than we were expecting. Um, so maybe some folks mix, missed that when we put it up in the beginning of the meeting. Um, so here it is again. Uh, if you wouldn't mind responding, there's just a few questions here. We'd appreciate that. Uh, it's for your benefit and ours. Um, and um, while we're waiting for people to respond there, um, just give everyone a chance to catch up a little bit here. And uh, if you have any questions on uh, what we've been showing you so far, um, go ahead and submit something to the Q&A or you can raise your hand as well and we'll, uh, we'll unmute you so you can ask your question verbally if you'd like. I think uh, today's uh, session is a little bit more uh, mechanical in a way. We're just showing you the the button presses and things that you need to do to to run the code. Um, the last session was um, maybe a little bit more complicated, even because we we're dealing with all the inputs and things like that. So. All right, I'm not seeing any new questions coming in at this time, but uh, if, if you do have questions, go ahead and you know, ask any time, of course. Uh, please respond to our poll as well. And then uh, turn it back to Cedric and we'll, we'll keep going through the presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so what we have seen so far is how to set up an Excel PR brand and how to run up to completion and save the results. Now, the next step is to look at how uh, you look at the result and how you can export them. We won't cover everything here. Some of this will be covered in the advanced section next week. So let's go back to the global setting dashboard. <coughs> and now we will focus on the uh, bottom part of the presentation. So on the bottom part, you have four sets of buttons. The left button are here to look at the results and the right button I here to look at the error. So the result can be on the top, the axial crack, and on the bottom, the sub crack. In our case, we will focus on sub crack because the only uh, direction we consider for this analysis was circumferential crack. 
in the right part, the error dashboard will inform you on um, potential error or warning that you may have observed, uh, well, that Gold Team may have observed when running the code. So one recommendation we do is once you have run your code and once you have saved your code, the first thing you should do is check the error dashboard to be sure that everything has been run as expected. If you open the error dashboard, you will have information for each of the modules. Most of the time, what you will see is gray square, which means that the module was not used for this realization, or green check mark. The green check mark means that the module perform uh, as expected. Now, sometimes you will see a yellow triangle, which is a warning error. The warning error may not be serious. It may be okay for your analysis, but there is something you have to know. So in this case, you will have to go and click, go to the error list and see what's going on and see if the warning is something you have to uh, correct based on your analysis or is something acceptable in this uh, framework. You may also have a stop sign, which is a fatal error. If you have a fatal error, you won't uh, usually stop call sim and arrive to the result. Call sim will stop before that and let you know that there is a fatal error. So it will be in post mode and it lets you check what's going on. And finally, you may have a red flag, which means that you have multiple uh, warning or fatal error in a same module. So before looking at the results, you want to check this. If you have only gray square, green check mark, you're good to go for the result. Now, we have another tip we wanted to mention in terms of um, running the code. Sometimes when you have a large sample size and also when you uh, consider many mechanisms such as axial and circumferential, such as PWCC and fatigue, the code will take some time to run, especially if you, um, if you have a large sample size. Uh, one frustrating thing is to run the code for two, three, five hours and discover that you forgot to change something so you have to rerun again five hours after. So what we recommend and save a lot of time in the long run is to run first with a very simple size that just take one to five minutes, confirm that there is no one or an error, uh, no warning or errors, check if the result looks reasonable, and if so, then you uh, bump up to your uh, original sample size and you can run the simulation especially at the beginning, save time because it's easy. You have seen that we have uh, more than um, 500 inputs that you can change and you can put distribution. And I think Matt mentioned that there is uh, tens of thousands of cells you can change in this model. So it's easy to make an error. Uh, so it's nice to check first before running a big case and discover uh, after five hours that something was not set up as, uh, as expected. Okay, let's go back to the results now. If you click on the result button, then you will have a new window, a new dashboard that contains several results. I won't cover the navigation on the right, it's just going back to the global settings or uh, to the different results or error dashboard. We'll focus on the rest of this uh, dashboard. On the top, you have what's called the general result. These results are the generic results that consider both axial and circumferential cracks. It can be just probability of having a crack, the first crack, whether it's axial or circumferential, probability of having a leakage, whether it's coming from one direction or the other, probability of rupture, the locus. So you have different information that's more generic for the web. Below that, are the direction specific results. So these are kind of the same indicator, but just for circumferential crack. 
when you're in the circumferential correct, correct result and just for axial correct when you're in the axial correct result. So it could be the probability of having a first circumferential crack, probability of having leakage due to circumferential crack, number of circumferential crack, and so on. And below that, here, highlighted in the red box are the crack specific results. So these are more, you know, for people who are interested in uh, the physical result of the crack and look at the evolution of crack. What I report here are the first crack, five crack in terms of occurrence time. So crack one being the first crack occurring, crack fifth being the fifth crack occurring. While you can have, uh, well, both is set up for 19 crack per direction, and you can increase this to up to 30 crack per direction. Uh, usually, with what we analyze, uh, seeing the first five crack is plenty enough. So for each of these cracks, you can see the type. And by type, we mean whether it's a surface crack, a swirl crack, if it has coalesce, if you're in a circumferential direction, the location of the crack, how much it leaks, and the crack property in terms of size, inner length, depth, uh, outer length, if it's a swirl crack, as well as the uh, stress intensity solution, which are um, in the different direction. Uh, for all of this, you can look at a specific crack for a specific realization, so you can track the evolution of this crack over time, or you can look at summary results like statistics and so on. So for all of this pattern, you have a result element lead, and all of these result elements will work exactly the same way as we will see in the next slide. When you press on it, you will have the result element open. Result. The result can be either in a chart form or in a table form. So we'll look at the chart form first. The chart form will give you the uh, evolution of the quantity of interest over time. So here we have, uh, in this example, simulations that run for 60 years. So if you click on charts, you will have the visual representation. If you click on table, you will have a table that looks like Excel. Uh, in the demonstration, I will show you how it looks like. Once you select this, whether you select chart or tables, you have different representations. The first one that's chosen by, uh, chosen by default is a real, realization. So you will see only one realization. When we say only one, it's only one epistemic realization. So it's for the outer loop. So it means that if you have 20 aleatory, you can still have a distribution here. The second option is all realization. So here you will see all the epistemic realization. So if you have a sample size of 200, you will see 200 curves. Now, because it's all realization, if we add all output, it will be messy. So when you're in realization mode, most of this uh, result element will give you a set of information. This is what you see in this example. We can see the probability of having a first crack, probability of having a first leak, probability of having rupture, um, different option, you know, whether you have in-service inspection or not, if you have a leak rate detection or not, and so on. So you can see all these curves. If you select all realization, then this button here that lets you select which realization you want to see will not be used, but it will be replaced by which output you want to see. So realization here, you can change to realization one, two, three. All realization, you can select which output you want to see. Probability of having the first crack, probability of click, and so on. The probability option will be the same thing, except it will represent the density where most of these epistemic realization are. And it will show you a density map. So same thing, uh, you will be able to select which output you want to see the density map. And finally, you have the statistics that calculates the uh, average or given quantile median of the you know, 95th percentile over this data. It will work. Um, 
like the realize, realization only, you will see all the output together. Uh, the only thing is you can change the statistic. You can see the mean, you can see the median, you can see a selected part. So as a summary, you can select in every uh, result element, you can select whether you see a chart or table, you can select different representation depending on what you want to see. Then the next icon is a chart style. This is why you can change the x-axis, you can put log scale and so on, you can change the uh, title of the x and y axis and you have some other options. If you are in table mode, this allows you to sort the results so you can look at the minimum value, maximum value and so on. And finally, there is a button that you can use to export the data which is called the access to result element. This button will only be available in the pro version. I will show you, you can still access to the element in the player version, it requires a little more um, steps, it's still available, but uh, it's kind of a shortcut if you have a pro version. So let's look at this uh, access to the um, result element. So as I say, in the next slide, I will show you how you can do this with the player version and I will demonstrate. But once you have access to this element, you can see all the outputs that are selected for this element and you can decide to put them. You can put them also on a different uh, scale on the y-axis if you want. So you can display them or not, you can change the color and the style for each of these. An important option is you can export all these results as text file or Excel file. By default, this will be set to none. If you change to text file or Excel file, this is a button on the bottom part of it. You will have a new tab that will appear at the top of this uh, windows. <clears throat> it's called export. If you click on export, you will have, you see this here in the dark, down part, you will have an option in the bottom part, you will have an option to export the data as a text file or as an Excel file. An important point, even if we haven't done it, if you want to put a name here, you will need to do this in edit mode. Gold team by default, uh, once you're in result mode, does not add you, uh, allow you to change anything. Gold team wants to the result to be fixed and everything, so everything is fixed, so it does not allow you to change also the uh, text file to export the result. So if you're in edit mode, you can access to this and change the name. If you're in result mode, you don't change the name. And by default, the name is blank.txt and blank.xlsx. You can still save it, you can still change the name once you're um, in Windows. Uh, it's just like a strange name by default. But you will still be able to export and we'll show you um, when I demonstrate this. Now, as I say, this is uh, this result mod is directly accessible with a pro version. If you have the player version, you will need a few extra steps. You will need to navigate through the model. So you remember this call sim run controller you have this menu button. Instead of going to file and save the results, you will go to navigation and you will go to model route. Go to model route. This will open a new window and on the right side, you will have all the results that are displayed. You look at the results that have the same name as the one you're interested, like here it was comparison detection. And if you right click on it, you will have an option which is property. And when you right click on the property, you will go to this property for this result element. So it's the same thing as a pro version. Okay, before going to the error, now I will uh, move back to our little example and show you how to set this up. Okay, so we are here, we have run the mod, uh, we have the result, we have saved it as a different name, and we are in result mode. 
as I say, the first thing we recommend is to click on the error dashboard to check that everything is fine. So here it is in the error dashboard, we see only gray squares and green check mark, so we are good. So we can go to the top. Now on the top, you have some navigation button. You can go back to global setting with the middle one. You can go to the actual error with the right one. The left one will bring you directly to the circumferential result. So that's the one we want to go. I click on it and I'm back to what we have seen previously, which is a circumferential result with a general result on the top, the specific direction specific result in the middle, and the track specific result. So as in the example, I will run the detection effect as a result. And here you see what are the result for realization, epistemic realization one. As we have 20 aleatory, we still have a distribution and not just um, an occurrence, so it's a probability for epistemic realization one. If I change here, I can see realization two, three, where nothing happened, four, five, six, and so on. I can change here the display. I can decide to see all the realization. If I press here, now I can look at the occurrence of crack. I can look at the occurrence of leak. I can look at the occurrence of rupture. This should include 10 re results because we have 10 realization. I can see this as a density function using the probabilities button. The probability button will give you a density that the darker are closer to the median and the lighter are uh, further from the median. And it shows kind of different quantity. It gives you an idea of where most of the results are uh, with respect to the epistemic. And finally, you can look at the statistics where you can change from mean, median, and so on. Not that, let me blow up this, if you move over the curve, it will tell you which curve it corresponds, and it will give you the X and Y location. So if you want to see what's going on uh, at 30 years, you may not need to go to the table. You can look at here, and you see that the probability at 30 years was around 14% uh, of having a crack. The next button we mentioned was the chart style. So if I press on the chart style, a new menu will open where I can change the different properties. Let's go to the y-axis and let's suppose that I want to present this in logarithmic scale. So I press logarithmic and I apply. XLPR will give, well, well Corsim will calculate automatically which uh, are the bounds. You don't necessarily want to go to 10 to minus 8 here. I can put 10 to minus 3 and apply. And now I will have the result in log scale between 10 to minus 3 and 1. And once again, I can move my mouse to see what the different results are. Uh, once this is done, you can close and you have access to um, your result. Now, as we mentioned, this is a chart. You can see it also as a table data. The table data will look kind of as an Excel uh, spreadsheet, and you can select any value and check what's going on. If you click on the result on the top, you will select the full set of data. If you click on a specific column, you will select this column. If you click on a specific row, which is a time step, you will select a row. Everything that uh, you can do with Excel like control shift down or control shift up or control down up will work with uh, Colsim. So you can take it, you can copy and paste with control C, control V and copy into Excel or any of the um, tools you want. And as mentioned, the Chart type become a sorting for the column, so you can sort a column or you can sort a row when you select uh, this. Uh, actually, a row, I'm not sure it's working, maybe only for the column. So you can sort your data and look at the evolution of the data. So this is how to look at the result. 
we can also export. If you are like me with a player version, this icon is great, so you don't have access. If you have the pro version of Gosling, you can click on it directly. If you're in the player, you will have to go to the Gosling controller, click on the menu, go to navigation, go to model route. In the right part of the module route, so I move with this and here, we have all this data. We were looking at comparison detection, so I can right click on it. I have property, and here is my property menu. Right now, I have only one tab. If I move here and I say I want to export as a text file, now I have the export tab. I cannot change the name, but I can still export. If I press, it will export. It says the export is completed. If I go to my folder, now you see I have this blank.txt file, which I can change if I want. And I can open it to have all the results exported. Okay. So this part over the um, reading of results. Now we'll move back to the presentation and we'll look at the term of detail, what to do when you have an error. So the most common error will appear in Gold Sim where you have a message when you run the code and you will see the status change to error. You will know which epistemic and aleatory simulation gives you an error. You can reset the simulation if you know what the problem is and start again, or you can check what's going on. Um, also covered in this slide is a pause mode. Even if you don't have an error, you can always pause the simulation and go in the realization, epistemic realization by realization to see what's going on. Well, if you have an error, most of the time, what will happen is Goldstein will give you an error message, tell you which module is affected and where the location is. So here we'll uh, do an example where we will change the crack rules to be negative, which is not accepted uh, by XRPR. You don't want the negative crack rules where actually instead of cracking, it starts to grow again. Um, what you will have is it will tell you, Gosling will tell you, okay, this realization uh, has a problem, so we stop the simulation. Uh, this element was the one that stopped, and the message is the module, the actual crack row model is affected. So in this case, what's happening is uh, XRPR does not accept negative crack rows, even if we don't run actual crack. Uh, Axial crack check on this and will say, oh, you have a negative crack rule, I have to stop and let you know. Now, there is a difference between Gold Sim error and XLPR error. These are XLPR error. We have set up a method just to check if something is wrong and we have a way to track this. But it's not a Gold Sim error, Gold Sim will just interrupt and say, this, this element tells me to interrupt. So when you have this, you can press continue and you will have the simulation continuing, or you can press pause. And pause will link you to the interrupt element, which may not be informative. So what you need to do is go back to the global dashboard, go back to the error, and then you will be able to track what's going on. One point that's kind of important is even if you're in the player version, when you're in this error debugging mode, you will suddenly have access on the top to all these options with the file and so on and the different menu options. So you will navigate through it to go back to the root. So what's happening is we'll move back to the error dashboard. This time we don't have uh, only green check mark and gray box, we'll have a stop button. So we'll go to the error list. If we go to the error list, we'll see that the error flag is written as 
106. And 106 means that in the list of error, it means that the power law constant, you can read this here, the power law constant is out of range. It has to be positive and we put a negative number. So this helps you to track uh, which error uh, may happen. So let's take a break from the presentation here, move back to um, the screen and let's create this error in our example. Okay, just to be on the safe side, I will open this file. So the result I've run are saved in a different file. So I just opened the original file. And I will open also I will op open also the Excel input file. Seems that I close by mistake the folder where we have uh, everything. So let me go back to Excel PR, Excel PR to our folder and to change program one. So now I open again the original file and I will input open the input set and create this error in the uh, crack row thread. I want to move back to edit mode so I can run the code again. So the crack row thread factor is defined in the weld folder. So I move to the weld folder I go to this power law constant alpha, and instead of 2 times minus 12, I change it to minus 3. Not that this will be covered in the advance, but uh, already the input file gives you which range should be used, and if you don't use the correct range, it will highlight in red. So you should have the information that something is not correct here. So even if it's not correct, we will save it, and we will run Goldstein again. So now we press play, we'll have this um, uploading import thing of all this data as we had previously, but this time, once the import is finished, the code will start to run and that's the first epistemic and first aleatory realization when um, the module discovers that this is not a valid value, we'll have this stop indicating Oh, there is something wrong. You cannot run this simulation. Okay, so the importing of data is sometimes a little longer. We don't know exactly why. Okay, so we have the last time running. And Oh my gosh, did I save? Okay, that's strange because it should give you an error here. And for some reason. It's running. So here you have a very good example of the Murphy law. Uh, we have tested this example several times. Uh, before that, and every time it created an error. So I don't know what's going on here, unless I haven't changed the code file. This is a correct file. This is challenge problem one. Let me check that I have opened the correct file. Okay, I will try another time, but if it doesn't work, we'll stop here. Um, and we'll go ahead with a different kind of error. Huh? 
Okay, well, let's give it just uh, 30 more seconds. If it's not working, we'll move back to the next set of error, which is the memory management. And uh, if you try this on your own computer, hopefully you have uh, reached the case where you have an error by changing this and the code has stopped. Okay, well, for some reason, this does not work. Why I tested this this morning and it was working. So let's move back to the presentation and go into the memory error. So here, uh, what we use for the framework is called C11.1. Uh, it's a 32-bit program. By default, 32-bit programs are limited to 3 gigabytes of data when you run, even if you run on a 64-bit machine and uh, OS. If the amount of data is required is larger, then Corsi will crash because there's no memory and it's stuck. Then it will start to rewrite. So that's why it's important every time a run is complete to save to be sure that you don't go beyond this thing. The biggest indicator for the memory requirement is in the Monte Carlo tab in the inner loop. The outer loop look just at the results that are saved uh, outside of the main model so it's not very informative. In the inner loop, you will see that if you change, if you have a larger sample size and so on, uh, this number, the purple number down will increase and it gives you an indication. Um, in our experience, if you try to go beyond three to 4,000 realization in the inner loop, you may start to see some error. You can expand by using both the epistemic and analytical loop you can do with a current model up to 8,000 realization, for instance, 80 epistemic times 100 dollar atory. Uh, from test, it seems that the formula is every time you run Goldstein, you need at least minimum 80 megabytes of initial memory plus a set of megabyte per realization. So each three set of realization add one megabyte, which means that the maximum size with your original model is around 8,000 realization. Now, they seem low, but there are ways to do more, and the next seminar will present ways to increase this limit uh, to a larger uh, sample size. Uh, for your information, we have run cases where you have hundreds of thousands of realization by limiting and by selecting some specific option. And in this graph, you can see the size of the uh, GOSIM file once it's saved. Uh, once you have, you know, 20 realization, 100 realization, 200 realization, uh, 400 realization, it's fairly linear once you pass the uh, limit. Okay, so we have covered up to now how to render SIM, how to look at the results, how to handle with error, uh, despite this strange uh, behavior. Now, I would like to cover something a little aside, which is how to navigate through the Dolphin model. We have approached it slightly at one time uh, when we wanted to navigate because the bu uh, one button was not available in the player file. Um, this will be useful when you move uh, into the more advanced method it's also useful when you want to look what's going on you know, in the model and better understand how the modular interact with shows. If you have the full version of GoldSim, you will have access to the model directly with a button on the top. Uh, you have two buttons. Uh, the first one moves to uh, the root container. The other one goes to the uh, 
main root container. And if you press one or twice, you will go to the root. If you have the player version, you don't have access to the button up front, so you will need to go to the navigation button. So the menu button, navigation, and go to model root model. And um, this is what we have done uh, when we wanted to have access to the um, result element. Now, if you move to the root model, root model you will have this. It's XRPR version 2.1. It's an object-oriented program, so you have object, and depending on which kind of object it is, they have a different representation. So that's uh, the goal in uh, graphics representation. You will have also uh, these kind of boxes, which have containers. You can think of them as folder where uh, we regroup the different things. Each of the container has a plus button on the top. If you press the plus button, you will go inside the container. So to navigate, you will just go in and out of the container. And if you want to go out of the container, you will have the buttons here on the top left that will be available. It's directly available. If you use the full version, um, if you use the player version, uh, you, you will need to go to the model route first. Now, what I will show you is how to access what we have presented in the pre previous uh, uh, seminar, which is the time loop for the circumferential track. So we'll go to the main model. We'll click on it. It will bring us here. Here, you will have all these module that um, all these containers that takes the information from Excellence 1 calculate additional data, and send this to the XLPR model. So we'll click on the XLPR model. In the XLPR model, you have a first container for the initiation. Then you have the circumferential loop, the axial loop, some post-processing, and some error checking and result check. So we'll go to the circ track, and then you will have this circumferential track loop where you have um, the time loop with the initiation, calculation of the case solution and growth, coalescence because it's circumferential crack, the transition, the stability, and so on. And in this next example, we'll go to the crack growth and look at the DLL that calls this growth module. So navigating through it may still be hard because there is a lot, many layers in XRPR. You can have access to the flow of information with any element. If you right click on an element, you will have access to function of, affect, or both of them. Function of gives you the upstream information from this element. For instance, if you right click on the DLL element, it will tell you all the elements that are sent so you can make the calculation. Like for crack rows, you may need to know the initial crack, you may need to have the case solution, and all of this will be done. So if you right click and go to function of, you will see all the elements that are affecting crack rows. Affect is the opposite. It looks at the downstream information. So if you click on DLL, you will see the elements that the DLL affect. Once it has calculated the crack rows, where does it send the information? Whether you're in function of or affect, you can press this plus button to see now which uh, element are affecting this one, and so on, so on. You can go as deep as you want. And if you click on one element, you will be sent to this element so you can see what's going on. So for instance, if I go to uh, the crack row DL and I click on this, it will send me to this element so I can look what's going on with this thing. We can change of container. We can jump from one container to the other. So it may be easy to be lost in this case. So that's why you have these two blue arrow buttons that bring you to the pro previous container you visited, and to the forward container you visited. So let me demonstrate this uh, quickly with uh, an example here. So here it is. We are in result mode, and we want to see what's going on in this element. So it's available both in result and edit mode. So I go to navigation and go to model. So now I have access to this previous 
and uh, next container. I will go to the main model, as I say. I will go to Excel PR model and then to subtract. And this is my time loop. I can go to subtract rules and then I have access to my DLL. By right-click on the DLL, I can have access to the function of so I can see which element affects this DLL. I can go as deep as I want so I know that this alpha GM2 affects the controller and I can see that it's this element. If I click on the element, I jump to this element directly, whichever it is situated in this section. So this is this element. If I move here back and forth, I may not know where I am, so I'm lost. But if I press here, I will go back to the element and I will go back to the DLL. So these are kind of the basic um, manipulation tools you can have to navigate to the model to learn more about the model. Um, it's not necessary to do this when you run the code. It will be more useful, uh, you will see in the advanced method that will re uh, be presented next week when you want to change things, when you want to save different output, when you want to do other things. Uh, navigating through the model is um, a necessity in this case. Okay, let me go back to the presentation now. Okay, and this is the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, we have done with, so we have presented you how to uh, run the model and look at the result. Now we are available for any uh, question you may have and we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Um, I was uh, I was able to reproduce your error there, Cedric. So I think um, let's uh, let's go to have some uh, questions. If you have any questions from the presentation, uh, go ahead and submit those in the Q and A. Uh, in the meantime, or, or raise your hand, and we'll. we'll open up your line for you. Uh, Files crossed. Um, so, Cedric, I'll. I think we have lost Matt. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Cedric. Okay. Um, so as Matt said, we are open now to uh, discuss anything you want. Don't hesitate to raise your hand or to ask questions um, on anything. And we'll be happy to uh, either go back to the presentation and to make tests uh, for you. Craig, do you want to add uh, something? Well, we don't know where Matt uh, disappeared to. I'm sure he'll be back momentarily. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, Yes. We heard part of what you okay, said. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Cedric, I think I uh, have your example uh, fixed. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm the presenter now. Uh, hopefully the audio issue is, is cleared up. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to let's see share my screen here. No, I don't think that's going to work. Um, I apologize for that. You, I'm having connection issues here. Yeah, we, um, we apologize for that. We have discovered sometimes that uh, by sharing, and because WebEx is taking uh, some memory, uh, some strange things happen, like uh, with Golfin. We don't know. I think it's a kind of a memory sharing issue. Uh, but for instance, uh, when you, uh, we can see your screen now. Right? Okay. All right. Maybe we can get this to work then. Um, okay. So, uh, like what what Cedric had basically shown was that the um, the power law constant on the uh, crack growth rate on the um, on the well tab was negative. It, you see that in the input set, it shows up as red. That gives you initial warning. Uh, but if you were to go ahead and run that input set, uh, which I'll do right here. And we should see that error that Cedric was trying to show. So we'll just give it a moment here. And again, if you have uh, questions, uh, go ahead and send them in. Yeah, so this is getting ready to run. We should see that error uh, pop up here just a second. There it is. Uh, so then I think Cedric, you were wanted to say show pause, right? So you could investigate the error. Yes. Okay. Pause. Okay. So, so now you have, you have access on the top to uh, the different box. So you, uh, if you go up to the top next to the blue arrow, the first yeah icon, this one with the one you click. Twice, not just one, the next one. Twice, and you go to Control Dashboard, which is in the center just below XLPR 2.1. And now we can go to Error Dashboard, Axial Crack, since it will be an Axial Crack first. And we see the stop on Crack Growth Rate for ID. We go to the Error List, and we see that the first crack is the error flag is 106. And if you read along the description of error, T106 is a power local instead out of range of validity. Okay, good. Yeah, so that was what we were trying to show earlier. Uh, so we're, I'm glad we were able to uh, get that resolved. I'm going to stop sharing yeah. that now. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I see we have a question on uh, the limitation uh, about there is limitation for the number of ballots we do realization due to memory problem. How does that self PR calculate extremely low probability? So I will do two answers on this. The first one is uh, in the uh, advanced technique, we'll see that it's possible to do larger sample size. Uh, with some change, especially if you're interested only with a mean value, and you can uh, you you reduce the number of uh, time-dependent results you save, you should be able to run uh, 10,000 or even more 20, 50,000 realization, which means that you can be in the range of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. Uh, markers will present also some techniques that reduce by saving, uh, even if you calculate at every time step, you can save the result not at every time step. And so you can also gain on this. 
The second thing is when we uh, talk about extremely low probability, it's often when we consider inspection and leak rate detection. And for instance, inspection will be a probability that we apply to it saying, well, you have one chance out of 100 to detect it or one chance out of or 90, 99 chance out of 100 to detect it. So it's only one out of 1% of chance not to detect it. So when you have uh, this uh, factor applied, even if you have uh, 10,000 realization, when you apply the factor saying, well, it's 10,000 realization, but you have only 1% of chance to miss this and to create a problem, you have this factor applied. So instead of being 10 to minus four, you go to 10 to minus five or 10 to minus six probability. So this is a case where the probability will go down just because uh, the likelihood of not detecting it is lower. And finally, uh, and that's something we have used, you can do replicate, which means that if you have uh, a case with 10,000 realization, you can do replicates by changing the random seed and make 10 cases of this, and suddenly you have 100,000 realization. Uh, in the analysis we have performed uh, for a conjunct project between NRC and EPRI, for instance, we have a case where we run 15,000 realization seven times, that give us a 100,000 realization, which means that we can detect around 10 to the minus five. So um, I hope this answers your question about this extremely low probability. If you have, uh, if you need more uh, detail, please don't hesitate to uh, add another question and uh, let us know what you want to know uh, specifically. I don't see any other question for now. And uh, we are pushing the end of this presentation. We are very close to the two hour mark. Um, well, XRPI is a complex code, and we know that we uh, cannot cover everything. And there are many things that you learn when you use a code. So we understand that right now you may not have questions and we'll pop up later. Uh, so please, if you have any question or if you block somewhere when running XRPI, don't hesitate to send us an email and we will try to answer as early as possible to any of your questions. Uh, whether you know it's on uh, setting up the input or running the code. Looks like maybe we lost Matt again. Yeah, Cedric, that's yeah. We have one last slide. Uh, yes, let's. I think Mart is the host now. Yeah, I say somehow I'm the host, and I'm not sure how that happened. Okay, can you move to the uh, last slide, please, Mart? Uh, Technical difficulties. Oh. 
Maybe if I accept being the host, I can move to the last slide. Oh, yeah. Is this the one you were looking for? Uh, no, that uh, was for the Q&A. Let's, let's move. Keep closing okay. remarks. So, so we, we would just like to remind everyone that uh, we do have one last seminar next Wednesday, same time slot, uh, August 5th. And we will be covering sort of an eclectic collection of advanced methods, uh, several things that Cedric uh, made reference to today, um, and just other trips or tricks and tips that may be useful to you as you uh, attempt to use XLPR and, and learn some of the the ways to uh, accomplish the kinds of analyses that it's capable of. And so we, we will get uh, information out of how to join that webinar uh, and, and look forward to your participation there. As Matt and Cedric have mentioned, all of these are being recorded and we will be making that uh, that information available to everyone how to access them. But uh, if you go to YouTube and search on XLPR, I believe you'll be able to find these recordings as they're posted. But we'll have other other pathways to help you get to this information as well. Um, Matt, did you manage to get back with us? Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I uh, I apologize for that. I think on the NRC side here, we've uh, just had some issues, both Giovanni and I. Um, let's see. So I will try to pick it up here and close this out because we're getting close to the end of the meeting here. Um, let's see, Craig, you looks like you reviewed the uh, our plans here for the next uh, session. That's next week. Um, I don't really have much else. Um, I don't see any outstanding questions or anybody raising their hand either. Uh, so let's go ahead and and uh, close this out. Uh, of course, if you have any questions or feedback, you can submit that to us at xlprnrc.gov and xlpr@every.com. And uh, we want to thank you again for your participation today. Um, and if you'd like, uh, as in the other seminars, we uh, if you'd like to provide feedback on NRC meetings in general, you can do that through the uh, NRC public website uh, meetings section. You just find this meeting. You can fill out a form there. Uh, we hope to see you next week. And otherwise, uh, look for uh, email announcements for me when the videos are posted. Um, I think I think that's it. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for participating, and uh, we hope to see you soon. And we'll adjourn. Thank you.